So hi everybody. I'd love to introduce uh, Philip Kim from University of Toronto, where he does well. He sits in the intersection of uh, computational biology and bioinformatics, and well, you know, like machine learning. Welcome, Philip. Yeah, um, thank you. Should, should I get going? Just um... oh, please, yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for uh, thank you for for the invitation to to speak at the venue. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we what we do in my lab, and I'll, I'll also touch a little a tiny bit about what we we do in, in a company I co in a stealth company I co-founded, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll touch on both very very briefly. Um, okay, so um, so it's it's been it's a very exciting time for for protein science in general and for protein engineering, and especially when it, when it comes to uh, when it comes to therapeutics, and uh, I would argue that. Um, that what's 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 driving this, this excitement right now is uh, is a it's a process that's been going on for for several decades, and uh, this process has, has included the the collection of a of a fair bit of data from uh, from fr from biology, um, and it, it of course includes Moore's law. So with the, we're we're having very very powerful computers. It includes the the, the development of um, of of novel machine learning methods to actually make use of both the data and the compute. To get us to where we are, and um, and the the and so I've been doing this for for, for a very long time, but um, I can tell you that, that there has never been as much excitement and as much sort of uh, speed and progress as there is now. So it's it's a really it's really quite, quite an amazing time to be to be alive and to be doing to be doing this uh, this kind of research. Um, okay, so um, I, I I guess I can skip that because because of the of, of the of the uh, sophistication of the audience. So, so I'm going to mainly talk about I'm going to mainly talk about um, the novo the structure based de novo design, and um, and so I would and so I want to want to I want to introduce a number of technologies that have been developed in the last you know just few years that really enable the um, the de novo design of, of biologics of, of uh, protein based therapeutics. So um, we have we have um, one one of the most important developments was the was the representation of 3D structure for for deep learning models, and in, and initially we had we had graphs, um, and this, this 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 turned out to be an efficient representation for for, for molecules, and uh, and then and now and now and now new approaches are these so-called SS3 equivariant approaches that, that that are quickly superseding graphs, and uh, and my own lab has, has done has done some 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 work on this, and we we were we were we were among the first to introduce graphs to protein design. Uh, back uh, you know, three or three or four years ago, then the, then the second was the was the development, of course, of, of transformers uh, that that everybody's very, very familiar with, and um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna touch in and in, in, in my last in my last uh, uh, the last section of my talk I'm gonna touch a bit on work we we did for for using transformers for for the design of zinc finger proteins, and then transfer learning has been very important for us um, because in in many biological applications we tend to be in a low data regime. And we, and we have to make use of transfer learning to uh, to, uh, to to get to get to get to, to get to better models. And then finally, of course, um, there's diffusion models, and that's and that, that enables that enable us to generate high high quality samples. And um, on my own lab also, we would have one of the first protein fusion models. Um, but but now, but the, the the development of technology is so fast right now that diffusion diffusion is already kind of outdated, right? And now, now there's now there's now there's new more powerful models that are, that are coming online. And finally, of course, we we, we have in, in the sequence space. Um, everybody knows about language models, you know, protein language models, antibody language models that are, that are very powerful. And we, we've done a bit of work on, on this as well in my lab. Um, okay, and I, I just want to want to want to note that um, that at at at, at uh, in at our at our startup, we're, we're sort of improving on the on the work that that I did in my, in my academic lab, and we're and we're we're sort of uh, supercharging this everything for for antibody design. Um, okay, let me introduce to you uh, very briefly um, um, how we how, how we go about protein design in terms of deep learning, and so and that's that's a bit of a that's a bit of a of a stroll down memory lane. So um, we're so back back in the day, um, a, a it was recognized maybe like three or four years ago that that graphs are are a good way to represent molecular structure. So the problem that we faced, or the field faced, maybe four years ago or five years ago, was that um, how do we? So we, we have these we have these powerful deep learning methods, but they're, so they're, they've been rather de mostly developed for for images and for texts, so for two D or one D type of type of data. And so how do we represent proteins? 
or molecules, which were just 3D objects, right? And um, and then um, and the, the very early approaches were, were based on voxelization, right? So you so you uh, so you, you you simply make 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 3D pixels, right? And then then you then you sort of you know, try to fit your molecules into these voxels, and then you do convolutions on them, and uh, the, none of this stuff really worked super well. And, uh, and so a, a, a big advance came when, um, when people started looking at graphs. And the, um, the, main, the, main, um, the main advantage of graphs here is, this, is, is this, uh, the, uh, are these uh, um, properties of rotation and translation invariance. So, um, so, the, so the main thing is, right, you, you have a, if, if, you have a pro, if you have a molecule in 3D space, right, and we, we describe its coordinates uh, in 3D space in a global frame, and then when you when you rotate the molecule or when you when you move the molecule, all the coordinates change, right? And uh, and so your model has to learn again that it, that is the same protein, I mean, it's, it's only turned, and that's, that, that that makes it pretty, pretty inefficient. And um and the, and also you have to you have to you have to discretize your your your, your coordinate system somehow. So with, with graphs, you you have to do neither. With graphs, the, the natural the, the naturally rotation rotation invariant, and then the naturally discretized. And then we we can we can sort of come up fairly easily. With a um, with a with 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 a efficient representation of molecular structure that um that is efficient to, to learn on, and uh, and and so these these graph based approaches are still pretty popular. So so they're, they're still sort of you know state of the art or close state of the approaches that you that you make use of graph based approaches, but um, increasingly, and I'll 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 um I'll I'll hint on that a tiny bit in a in a in a later part of the talk. Increasingly now there are superior approaches that that have been developed. And these are largely these these SS3 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 equivariant approaches that um, that have some that, that have some mathematical advantages of of these graph based approaches. So um, back back in the back in the early days, so that uh, that goes back to, to 2018 when we started the work, which feels which feels like an eternity ago. Um, we developed an, an an inverse folding approach. So um, so a protein design that. Uh, that um, that that, that solves the inverse folding pro folding problem. So so you you're given given the protein structure, and you want to find the sequence that that fold the, the, that fold into it, right? And and that's also known as the protein design problem. So um, what we effectively did is we we present we present we represented the protein structure as a graph, and then we can we can train it on 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 many many structures, and we can train it on many 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 sequences. And then the and then the then the method can learn how to fill the structure um, correctly with a with a given sequence, and then um, and then lo and behold our 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 our, our method called protein solver would then um, would then would then yield folded proteins. You can see here that when we when we when we back then we measure the sequence identity um, back back to the back, back, back to the benchmark uh, proteins were we're shooting at around like you know 38, 40 percent. And um, and that and back then in the in the in 2019 2020 that was state of the art right so but by now by now new approaches have been developed that that all perform protein solver with, with with better engineering and better and better better better, better approaches so but but back then so as I said so we 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 could prove that um, when we when we when we give protein solver a set of protein structures um, that are that are very different. It always manages to come up with a with a with with, with a protein sequence that will fold into exactly the structure, and uh, so that was back in the day that was in the pre alpha fold world. So we, we had to use physics based methods to actually fold these, but 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 it still works. We can we can make use of other physics based physics based methods to to convince ourselves that these really work, and this is, this is based on molecular dynamics. So these proteins, when you when you simulate them on a computer, they don't fall apart, but but they they, they really stick together. And finally, we actually made some of these proteins in the lab, and we can we can show that they that they perform in biophysical experiments uh, that they are that they are high, that they are nicely full of proteins, and they and, and that that increase the likelihood quite uh, quite a lot that that they, that they actually look like look like the, the way we designed them. And as I mentioned now, um, related approaches that that outperform proteins that have been developed, and most famously most famously protein MPNN, which which came out last year. But which is really um, con conceptually is 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 very similar to Proton Solver. It's it's but but it, but it is it is admittedly a, a better engineer model. Um, I just want to mention very very briefly that um, you know these graph based approaches like Proton Solver, Protein MPN, they um, they they've operated on the, on the on the local frame, and so molecular detail is is much more difficult to um, much more difficult to capture. Right when when we we wanna when we wanna um, 
when we effectively we have to we have to encode these distances here or these these um, these relative relative positioning of different molecular features into 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 several constraints, right? And when I when I operate in the global frame, I can I can much more easily locate this, this differences, and that's one of the sort of intuitive reasonings why with equivariant reasonings in a global frame are 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 more are more efficient, and uh, and we we at Fable we we developed those models for for antibodies, and as as we as we can see here for for in this in this sort of inverse folding sequence design problem, so the 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 models we developed at Fable and we call we call it REM. Um, outperforms previous approaches, um, you know, protein solvers is around here, and we with graph-based approaches like protein MPN, where we go, we go, we go what here, and with protein MPN, with with REM, we outperform the state of the art quite uh, quite handily. So, um, what's the key idea? Because yeah. I, I mean, I get that that you want global context, but are we talking yeah. about like a transformer or some other way of getting like a globality? Sorry, uh, how are you getting the global context? I didn't get the intuition. Oh. Um, Okay, so it's it's simply that you know if you're if you're um, um it, it, it's when you're when you talk about so especially when when you talk about a protein binding another protein right so what uh, what 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 intuitively really, really matters right is that you is that you get the that you get the um that you get the that you get the small details right about about what several and several amino acids interacting with each other right mm -hmm. and that's that's much that's much easier to do if you're if you if you remain in a, in a global frame so if you're if if you know that, that these coordinates are close to each other globally, mm -hmm. that, that that makes it much easier for for your model to, to figure that out. If you're if you're operating in the, in the local frame, then you have one protein in in a, in, a, in a local frame, another protein in the local frame, and to to figure out that that these two atoms here are going to be close to each other, you have to go back to the you have to go, you have to go back to the residue frame, and then and then you have from the residue frame you have to figure out the direction, and then from the direction you you you, you, have, you have to figure out that that actually. But actually, you have, to, you have to make several operations to figure out that these relatives actually close to each other. And that, 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 that's sort of the intuition. So, but, but now we're getting, so the context is we have a graph. So let me, let me get you in the, uh, the graph convolution. So yeah. my intuition here is I have um, a sequence, which is a graph, and I have the, pro, the, uh, the what's called the amino acid bi direct bonds. Uh, they're not 3D bonds. And then you have a bunch of graph edges that you just don't know the distances along the graph edges and from your library that you trail and you infer what the distances might be. And then actually tell me if I get this right. Once it folds, do you get additional bonds or are these in the sequence all the chemical bonds? Um so, so okay, so 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 we so we have to distinguish here between um between you know covalent bonds, so between sort of bonds mm -hmm. between between the in between the atoms and the molecules, right? And non-covalent interactions between be, between different molecules, right? Right. And so, uh, and so, what's what is what what is what is sort of easier for the model to figure out when 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 you when you operate in a, in a global frame is the is the relative is the is the relative um, positionings of of atoms between two between two different molecules. All right. I mean. What do Sorry? I mean, uh, w in which atoms on different molecular arms, which are in 3D space close or yes, in, yes, in yes, space yes. Close. yes. So, so, yeah, so, so you're talking about two different molecules, right? And there, and you wanna, so, so in the, in the, in the antibody antigen problem, right? So, you, if you mm -hmm. have, um, you have, or in the protein protein interaction problem, right? So, you, 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 you wanna find, you wanna make a protein that binds the other protein as, as well as possible, right? Mm -hmm. And for, and for that, what, what you have to get right is you have to, you have to, um, you have to you have to get uh, you have to get the molecular detail right at the at the interface right, mm -hmm. and um and for that it's it's gonna be it's gonna be really it's gonna be really important you know what uh, sort of the molecular detail of of like single atoms or, or single single residues is, is gonna be really important on the, their relative positioning right, and uh, and so that that's gonna be much easier if you're if if you if you have some view if you have some view on that in the, in, the, in the global frame because because in the global frame you can you can, you can easily tell whether we're things are close to each other or not okay and and then yes and how did you incorporate this global frame because it, it seems like hey once you get this graph you get some idea of kind of how with the different arms of the protein oh yeah yeah okay so 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 i'll i'll i'll, I'll, I'll sort of i'll sort of have to have to refer you sort of have to refer you to the literature on that so, so, I'll, so I'll, okay. it's, it's going to be a little, a little math to go through but 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 ultimately ultimately sort of the the idea is, is that you is that you can you can make this model oper operating staying in the global frame operating with coordinates right mm -hmm. um, but but you but what, what you have to do is you, you have to you have to find uh, 
you have to find architectures that are that, that, that are that are equivariant so that so that, that that operate that that so that they can remain operating in the global frame. So the yeah. invariance of graphs is sort of a, sort of a nice sort of a nice or simpler sort of a nice nice or simpler way out, right? But but it's but but it's ultimately a bit a bit less efficient. But it ultimately what? It's ultimately less efficient. Less efficient. Less for efficient. The yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, right. So, uh, secondly, I, I'm sticking 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 with 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 the graph um, with, with the graph approach for a second because because we're, we're still talking about what's uh, somewhat older work here. So, um, so what what we wanted to build was a was a predictor of of peptide binding, which which is related to protein protein binding, and um, and so um, so so what we're so so what we're, what we're trying to do is. Um, we were we were trying to build uh, a novel attention module that could um, that could that, that could operate that, that could operate in, in in both directions. And we we developed this module called represent reciprocal attention that, uh, that 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 enforces symmetry. And what that effect, what, what that what that effectively allows us to do is to is to let the is to let the the peptide talk to the protein and the protein talk to the peptide in both directions. And sort of chemically or biochemically, what what that corresponds to. Is to is to allow for conformational changes on, on both sides of on both sides, and uh, and then we're and then we're we're we we obtain a model that can um, that can model the um, um, that can predict the the, the 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 binding side of peptide quite quite accurately. Um, what we what we had to do for this model to for this model to work is we we had to uh, we had to incorporate transfer learning. And that's something that, that that you see quite often in, in, in biology is that the that your actual training data is, is, is relatively small, and so for um so for a uh, for, for 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 peptide protein binding, if you, if you look at the PDB, which which is essentially the idea of data there is in, in the, in the, on a structural level, you are you end up with about three thousand uh, complexes. Um, so that's that's not a huge amount of data. So what what you what you what you then have to do is you, you have to be um, a little bit smarter about it, and so what? What we what we what we what we then do is we we, we generate a much larger uh, pre-trained data set that is related to to our problem, but but is not quite like it. And for the for the peptide protein problem, we um, we generate this fragments for a, a, a data set. So we we have a way to effectively identify fragments of proteins that are binding other proteins, and these are. These are by definition peptides, but but we're but we're but we're um we're, we're extracting them from protein protein complexes, and so um and so we're 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 extracting them in, in such a way that they're quite likely to bind by themselves, but but it's not totally clear that they will. So it's with a lower quality data set, but but they have many properties that um that many properties than the, the peptide protein complex would have, and this, this data set is much larger. So we, we have about a half a million of these of these uh, of these fragment complexes. And so we use this to, to pre-train our model, and then we then we fine tune on the on the real data, and we and we get our final model. And we can see that um, that our performance is substantially larger when when we when we use a pre-trained when we use a pre-trained set, and uh, it's, it's it's somewhat lower if, if we use if we use only a peptide complex or if, if we only have fragment complex. And you can see here in this one example that our pre-training really really helps. And likewise, when we when we use a sequence-based model, we um, we use we we do we do uh, we we do, we do substantially better if we if we do if we use if we use a pre-trained thing on on a, on on known embeddings. Um, okay, so um, finally, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about uh, de novo protein design, and de novo protein design is 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 a is a is quite a difficult problem. So um, so we we spoke I spoke very briefly about inverse folding. So when you when when you have, when you have a protein structure in mind, you can use an inverse folding algorithm like protein solver, protein M and N, to get the sequence that will that will that will uh, that will uh, that will likely represent this, represent this protein. When you do de novo protein design, you want to do um, you want to um, you want to generate both the sequence and the structure um, of a, of a fully novel protein that that, that will that will that will fill, form a real protein. And so and these proteins may never have been seen in nature, right? So it's, it's uh, they're fully novel. You can do this either either unconditionally to get to get fully novel proteins, or you can do it conditionally. So you can you can condition on some sort of scaffold or motif from some sort of target to get to get other proteins that uh, that that that, uh, that are conditioned somehow on a on a on a on a motif. And for this, we, we develop protein SGM, 
So, um, you know, diff diffusion is, is not really that old, but uh, but but it only became popular like like two years ago when um, when when it started winning the, the image generation co co competition. So before and about all GANs, right? And uh, and, and about two to three years ago, the the the, um, the um, diffusion models, the DDPMs, the SGMs, and, and all the model following started, started to win. And DALI of all stable diffusion are are examples. And I think I'll, 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 I, can, I can sort of skip that now, so you're so you're, you're learning the noise, right? And so we we developed a protein SGM uh, based based on the SGM framework. And so this framework um, this framework allows us to um, to use to effectively use an image-like representation of proteins, so we're so we're presenting we're representing a protein with with this with these four matrices plus a padding matrix that um that 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 that, that, that effectively just uses images, and so one of the matrices is, is is effectively just a graph of the of the of the distances, so a so so a weighted graph of distances of the of the C beta to to, to C beta atoms and in each residue, and then the other the other matrices are angles that that describe that is, is, is describe different features, the molecular features of the backgrounds, and so together these so-called these so-called six D representation gives us a full representation of the backbone, and and then we can we can we can use a, a relatively off-the-shelf diffusion model to essentially learn um, how these how these six D coordinates look like for real proteins, and then and then we, we we can generate new ones, and then use a sequence design method like protein silver or MPN in order that are to get to get to get the to get a full atom structure of both the of both the sequence and the, and the structure, and I wanna and uh, I can sort of proudly proudly announce that protein SGM was, was one of the first protein protein diffusion models out out in our archive on uh, last summer, and uh, that that also feels like an eternity ago, and uh, then and we were out for, we were out uh, essentially earlier than than chroma or, or Baker sort of diffusion. So um, although I, I should say arc diffusion is. Chroma and Artifusion are quite are both quite good models, and and, and at least Artifusion uh, does outperform the Protein SGM in, in some metrics. Um, okay, so what we what we could easily show is that we we're getting out proteins that by by any by any sort of computational metric like 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 by Rosetta energy, like by bio, bio energy, we're getting out things that look like just like real proteins, and and if you look at them here, they look just like real proteins, and by the by the sort of TM score metric, so the TM core greater than less than 0.5 to the PDB means that they're that they're new proteins, that they're 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 considerably different from anything that's in the PDB. So these are proteins that are have really never been seen before in nature. And this SC this SPTM score is a self-consistency metric. So basically in this in this alpha fold world, we can we can sort of trust alpha fold that, 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 it's, that it's gonna it's gonna do a good work, it's gonna do a good job, and this omega fold is gonna do a good job. Given a sequence of getting getting the right structure, and with SCTM we essentially measure if we're if, if we're starting we'll be getting a protein designed by by protein SGM, where we're within within half a structure, and then we're we're we're, we're designing the sequence that we're getting getting a full atom model, and then we're taking the sequence out and we're refolding it again with omega fold or alpha fold. Do we do we get the same structure back? And and here we're, we're on our average SC, 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 is our, we're getting a large number with SCTM scores of 0. 0.8 and 0. 0.9, meaning that they're effectively the same the same structure. So so that so that that's actually a quite quite a high performance of um in terms of, in terms of designability of our, of our of our structures. And then finally, a yeah. Question about uh, kind of the application domain. So when you say it's a backbone, uh, are you yeah. saying that you can? It, it, it is just the backbone of a protein to give you an overall 3D design, and you can attach like binding sites to that structure, or is it the fully finished uh, oh. kind of protein oh, okay. that you just, 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 just maybe 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 a uh, maybe, maybe a slight a slight nuance here is that so the so um when 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 we talk about backbone, we're 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 we're, we're effectively talking about just the just sort of the core the the, the the core of the protein without side chains. So in, in the protein world, we're talking we're, we're distinguishing between the backbone, which is which is sort of the the, the peptide string of the protein, and, the, and all the side chains, right? And so uh, protein SGM like Chroma, like RFDF, is, a, is ultimately a backbone model. So, so it'll, it'll generate it'll generate this this sort of representation, which which is basically just sort of the, the naked backbone. So so just the just sort of the 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 the, 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 the polyglycine, if you will, sort of sort of a, sort of something. 
So just just peptides, peptides fused together without any side chains. And then to make a full protein, you have to use a sequence design model to put in, to put in all the side chains so, so, so that it'll, it'll actually fold into, into that structure that, 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 you, that you want it. So that's just a, that's a, that's a nomenclature we, we usually use in the protein world. OK, thank you. Um, so but what, what, you, what, you, what you have to do, of course, is you, you have to show that, um, that the proteins you're making are real. And we, 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 took, we took two examples here um, that, uh, uh, that, that are fully novel. So, so, these, so these, these don't exist in nature, these, these proteins, right? And, um, and again, we, we're making them in the lab. And we can, we can see here. So in, in this experiment, this, this, shows, this shows that this protein is clearly a helical protein that, that's by, by, this, by, this, by this experiment called, called the CD spectroscopy. And so this also protein is also clearly a helical protein. And, it's a, and this, this experiment shows that it's a, it has what, what people call a, a nice two-state two folding transition. So it means that it's a real protein that, that behaves like a behaves like a normal protein, and then in all likelihood it, it looks like this because because alpha fold lens it looks like this. So so we're we're really making real novel proteins never seen before in nature, and maybe to to touch on what what you asked if, asked earlier is what we can also do is we can we can use in painting so we can we can fix we can fix you know certain regions of the protein and we and we can we can only noise other regions and then and then do do in painting. And we can do that here by, by fixing the scaffold here, and then and then just impainting this this part of the protein, or we can or we can also just fix one motif of the protein and then and then and then impaint the whole scaffold and we're getting sort of other proteins that, that have this region the same but 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 then have, have different scaffolds, and so and in each case it, it generates protein SGM will generate real folded proteins and uh, and and impaint both domains of scaffolds. Um, question, yeah. But if you start painting, uh, the natural question becomes uh, uh, designer proteins where, depending on where you bind other proteins, it starts yeah. changing shapes like the walking molecules and whatnot. Yeah. How feasible is that with this foundation? Oh, so 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 it, it it is quite feasible. So so we can we we, we definitely do, and I'll I'll get to that actually in in a, in, a, in, a, in a couple of slides. Great, thank you. So. Um, so just 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 as a as a as a small as a small segue from that, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll get back to full protein later. We also so I'm I uh, I I am uh, um, I've, we've been working on, on on peptide therapeutics and peptides in general for for a long time, and so we also developed helix GAN like a long time ago and helix diff as as full atom peptide generation models that are that, that are that are again so like so helix GAN was was again and then diff is is, is an SGM. Um, that that builds peptides built based on hotspot residues, and we can uh, we can actually show that you know GLP-1. Um, so GLP-1 is now is now become a household name. Uh, so everybody knows Ozempic and Rebelsus and the and the, the, the uh, so you, you may have heard of the, of the weight loss drugs, right? This, this weight loss this weight loss drugs that you, that you inject yourself that you inject into your into your into your stomach. Um, and um, and so GLP-1 is, is, is one of the most famous peptide drugs because it's, it's the most popular one. And so um, what we can do actually, we can make, we can generate new versions of GLP-1 that, that contain, that are composed of the so-called mirror image amino acids. So, so D amino acids that are the mirror image of normal amino acids. So they may, may, may have heard of chirality. And uh, anyway, so that has a number of sort of, that, that has a number of advantages from, from, a, from a drug development point of view because, because they're very stable. So they, they don't degrade in, in the bloodstream. The GLP-1, you know, has has a, has a limited half-life in the blood in the bloodstream. You can make them as mirror images. They, they'll 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 stick around much much longer. So 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 exponentially longer than than GLP-1. So you, so you would have to inject yourself much 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 less often. I can show here that we can make quite easily. We can make these mirror image versions of GLP-1 that that you know that are that work a little bit a little bit worse, but 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 are still active. In activating the GLP-1 GLP receptor, so would would actually be be um, would actually be uh, at least viable alternatives to 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 the therapeutics. Okay, so that's just a little segue. Um, so I, I wanted to talk very briefly then now about, about using using an SGM type approach to make to make to make antibodies. And antibodies, of course, are are molecules that bind other molecules that that, that can be that can be and are very popular therapeutics. And so. Um, so here we we simply developed a an, an SGM type method to um to to do to form antibody design and we can use that to do to design especially the H3 loop so that the most important part for antibody binding by impainting you can see here by, by these metrics by the amino acid recovery rate or by 
or by the RMSD, but the similarity to, to, to the known benchmark, we outperform um, you know, sort of the, 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 the previous method like, 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 like diff AB by, um, you know, we, 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 we sort of edge it out and you can see here, these are sort of a, a real antibody loop that's been generated with, with, um, with, with antibody SGM. And we're and we're, we're, we're sort of putting, putting that up on our archive pretty, pretty soon. Um, I just want to mention that at Fable we uh, we, we developed our, our our own diffusion model, and here we're 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 all performing um, the state of the from previous work by quite handily both by by AAR so by the recovery rate and by by RMSD by similarity to the known loops, and we're and we're getting realistic antibody candidates out out of out of out of our diffusion model. Um, and let me just skip that. So, um, okay. So I wanna, I wanna now, I wanna now talk about the um, the dynamics of the um, how do you, how do we incorporate dynamics into into our into our machine learning models? And that's and that's really sort of sort of the next the next the next step or then the, the the next frontier in in machine learning for protein structure. And so this is, this is particularly important for, for peptides. It's also important for, for antibodies with CDIH3 loops. But, but these are highly dynamic molecules. And, um, and also for peptide macrocycles, which are important drug, drug class. Um, so um, you know, alpha fold and, and the, the other folds effectively have, um, have mostly solved the, the single structure problem, right? But, uh, but what, 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 remains, what remains to be solved is how do we incorporate dynamics? How do we, how do we can, how, 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 we, how, how can we, how can we uh, capture that uh, the, the peptides really or proteins really really are dynamic molecules? And so what we need is we need methods that can learn the conformational space. So um, so we we so there there are sort of physics based methods to do that. And uh, and as a physicist, you know you you think you think of think of conventional space as, as the energy landscape, right? And then, then there's minima and then maxima, right? And here's a couple of minima, and 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 it, it makes it in this minimum, and then go go to other minimums, a minima, sorry, and um, and so the so the main the main approach the main problem is that you know we we um, even if we have a good function of the of the energy, and so and these are usually usually described as force fields, then it's it becomes computationally very expensive to to describe the entire landscape, and so especially if you have a trajectory type based approach like like the dynamics of Monte Carlo, it's still it's still um, prohibitively expensive to sample the, the entire landscape, even for even for um, even for our, our best supercomputers that we that we have in the world. So and you know just just to give you an, just to give you an, an uh, just to give you an, an idea, so with with sort of modern you know with with modern GPUs we can we can get to like you know hundreds of nanoseconds. Um, you know, but but uh, but but getting tens of microseconds, even that is going to be is going to be quite expensive. For even even just for even just for one molecule. And if you want to if you want to observe the formation of a beta herpin of a peptide, that that's that put it at the edges for a single peptide, that puts it at the edges of what a what a what a modern supercomputer can do. Um, okay, so what we well, we can solve this with machine learning. So what we can do effectively is. Um, as we can we can train um, a machine learning method, the so-called Boltzmann generator, to um, to effectively learn the transformation from a from a basis distribution, like like in this case a Maitreyi Gaussian, to a proposal distribution uh, that, that 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 operates in the in the peptidectomic coordinates. And this distribution here, we want we want it to be this energy landscape, right? And then um, and then if we can if we can train such a Boltzmann generator, we can train our our method to effectively learn the entire the entire energy landscape of the peptide in one go, and um and and we can we can then we can then effectively describe the the uh, the conformational uh, all the entire conformational landscape of the peptide uh, using using this approach. Um, so um we 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 built one of these and initially we we built it on on on, on CNFs and later on later so so we started this work before. For really, really diffusion was was a thing, and so we we initially used use CNF methods to because we, we need network 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 invertibility, and then later on uh, CNFs are are quite are quite tricky to, to deal with. So later on, where we um we we, we changed uh, we changed towards diffusion models, and now of course there's the the new shiny thing and the new shiny tool in the box is flow matching, and 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 so I think the next version of PetFlow is gonna is gonna be a flow matching model, so and uh, we. Sorry? I mean, this sounds like a Gaussian kind of approach. We have a well, 
this is where I get lost because now it, it, uh, I'm not familiar with Boltzmann generators, but it sounded like you know like a Gaussian kind of a process, except uh, this for the molecular bits, which is like what's the intuition there? Uh, sorry, I mean, so 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 the base distribution it it can be it doesn't have to be Gaussian. We 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 use the Gaussian here, and then and then the diffusion mode that has to be Gaussian, right? Um, but so so the the main the intuition is just that we're that we we want to we want to learn we want to learn this Boltzmann distribution of the molecule, right? And importantly, we, we want to we want to learn that in a in a sequence dependent fashion, right? So we want to learn it. We want to basically want to want to give us a peptide sequence or the or just just sort of a a um, a general a general descriptor of of the chemical properties of a peptide, then we we, we want to we want to be able to to, sim to simply get the to simply get the get the Boltzmann distribution out in in one go, right? So that, that, that's that's the goal, and we can we can do that by by training on by by doing training in two phases. So training on training on known data, so that we have to call training by example, and then the the key the key is if you, if you if you have such a Boltzmann generator that's invertible, you can you can you can you can train by you can train by energy. You can you, you can you can actually use can actually use this energy function here to um, to then to then to then to then flow back and to and to then to then train your train your your um, your Boltzmann generator on generated generated conformations. So then, what makes it? I mean, I guess I can imagine just like a, a Gaussian process, just like whenever I get a point, like dump a Gaussian there and approximate that way. But it sounds like this sequence sensitivity so, so, gives you so, something okay, more. So, so, you, so you can you can of course do that. So um, so you can so given the inner function, you 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 can you can always sample, right? So yeah, exactly. You can always sample, but but it's it's just very expensive, right? So, so yeah. So so we we so the, in the in sort of the classical um sort of physical chemistry world, we have been doing this kind of sampling for you know for for decades pretty much right with molecular dynamics or or more MCMC but um it's is the main problem is it, it is it is really really expensive right and so and, and especially if you want to if you want to do if you want to do design right then you, then you want to sample not 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 one not one not tens and hundreds not thousands you want to want to want to do the sampling on on millions of possibilities right and so, and so that that's still astronomically expensive so you you, you simply can't do that so with so that so what, what we want to what we want to do is we want to we want to build something that given given the peptide sequence so which, which is a molecular descriptor of, of, of a molecule we want to we want to get out the the, the confirmation the, the entire energy confirmation the entire confirmational energy distribution for free or not for free but but, but, but for much cheaper and oh we, so should i be thinking of this as uh a generator model that generates the entire space the entire yes distribution. yes effectively effectively that helps the intuition a lot thank you effectively effectively so in in petflow right so the petflow is is a three state model it it first it first it first um it first uh, has so importantly it 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 can it contains a a hyper network the hyper network effectively predicts the the um the parameters of the of the other networks so, so in this case we have a backbone network and we have a we have a rotomer network that's just have a side chain and for, and for very technical reasons that we we don't have to worry about well we also have a protonation network I can see here that this that this uh, this backbone network learns learns sort of how how, how protein backbone is supposed to look like, and the rotomer network learns how the how the side chain is supposed to look like, and then the finally the, the, the protonation network would would learn that for well, the hydrogens. But a, a key a key part of it is that we have this hyper network, and that that makes it um that makes it fully sequence dependent. So we can we can just drop in a new peptide sequence into petflow. And it'll 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 and it'll it'll generate automatically the 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 the, the allowable confirmations for for us. Um, to do this through. So what, what we can see here is if if we 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 can we can we can we can generate pep confirmations from from pep flow, and we we always we we almost always get realistic looking peptides. And you can see here that instead of the molecular the normal molecular features like uh, like bond lengths or bond angles or the or these or these Ramachandran uh, plants. We're getting, we're effectively getting, getting things out that look just like a round truth. So, so, so it learned, it learned basically most of the molecular physics that that were that that we we as a field know about. Um, and so that that holds true also for also for um, for 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 these for, for the bond angles here. And you can you can see here that for um, for this particular chi three bond angle, it um, it it so so the ground truth here is in blue. And the generated ones are in orange, so 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 it allows this deviation here 
But um, I, I would point out that this is, this is a feature, not a bug, because um, because for so for pep flow, um, because because this because this oxygen this is a carboxy group, right? And chemically, it's indistinguishable whether it's flipped this way or it's flipped this way. And because in 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 our in, in, our, in our case, we distinguish these atoms, so, so we will allow both conformations. But that's that's really just a just a better just the representation of, of the chemical reality. Um, and then you can, you can see here that we're 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 very well representing the the, 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 the molecular dynamic simulations. And um, when you when you when we use PEPFLOW in a structure prediction um, uh, kind of way, so you, you can actually do that. You can you can actually just get it to predict predict the best structure. It it thinks it thinks exists. We do edge out the state of the art. So we're we're with slightly edging out alpha fold and ESM fold, and when there's and there's a number of structures where we we, we do substantially better. Most importantly, when we compare ourselves to the conformational ground truth, which is NMR NMR ensembles, so we're 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 actually, we're actually doing much we're actually doing quite well at covering this, this NMR ensemble. So we we cover about half of the conformations in the in the NMR ensembles. And uh, and so and so this gives us a, a pretty pretty good pretty good uh, pretty good coverage of of what uh, what a, what a, what, a, what a peptide looks like really in reality. And then finally, for for application purposes, we can we can allow we can we can use PEPFLOW to generate macrocycles, and this is important as therapeutics. And um, when when we look at it here, so we we can actually use PEPFLOW to to quite accurately predict the structure of of macrocyclic compounds, and we can use PEPFLOW in a generative way. To, to generate binding peptides can condition in the pocket. And what, what we can what we can then use and what, what I think is very exciting is to do generative dynamic macrocycles uh, condition on both binding pockets and, and set permeability, which, which is sort of a holy grail in uh, in macrocycle structure prediction and that name macrocycle development. Okay. So and just to um, just to close on, on the on the pet flow part, um, so the the um, um, Development of um, of 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 technology in this area is extremely fast. So as I said, from when we when we got started, we 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 uh, we developed PEPFLOW as a CNF, and uh, that did work. But but it was but was really but was really uh, really difficult to train because the CNFs had to be very expensive to train because you have to do you have to you have to solve an ODE for for every 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 time you every time you 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 want to train the data point. Then um, current PEPFLOW. Is um, is based on score matching, right? And, and it uses the hyper network, and that works. That works quite well. So um, we're we're right now. Very, uh, uh, Osamo is very very busy right now. Bring online Petro plus plus, which is built upon a PFGM plus uh, plus architecture that 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 actually that that in our hands actually does lead to a quite a performance increase over 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 SGMs. And we we also also replace the EGN layers with equiformal layers. So which 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 gives us a bit more express it's a bit of a more expressive version of these um, equivariant uh, neural networks, and then and then we'd be enabling straight line design. Um, okay, I'll, I'll my 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 last my last uh, story I want to tell is about is about in vivo in vivo in vivo uh, gene editing, and um and so there, there's an AI aspect here too, but but I just want to mention really quickly when we when we want to do um when we when we want to do therapeutics, so what, what I've talked about so far is mostly targeting the protein. We can also target the mRNA with using using these using these newer or those, all these sort of you know uh, other approaches. But what, what we want to do is we want to target the gene directly, and, and we, we call this epigenetic editing. And what, what we what we want for that is we want to we want to target we want to use the transcription factor that we reprogram. And then we, we, we can we can alter the gene expression of any of any gene we want to, and we can use that for for, for a variety of of, um, of therapeutic purposes. So um, so there are there are a number of technologies out there, and many of you may have heard of CRISPR, and uh, there's all the talent or, or, or other technologies. So all of these are great technologies, but all of these have a have a problem, and the main problem is they all have is that they all come from bacterial proteins. And it's it's just it's generally not a good idea to inject ourselves with with with, with bacterial proteins because our immune system will, will not like it, and will will react quite violently. And so that and that's that's a known and and very and very big problem with 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 all these methods. If you want to do if you want to make drugs or therapeutics that are that are administered in vivo, so that we that we want to inject ourselves with. 
it works great for so called for so called XDB applications. So you you take you take out part of your cells, you 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 edit them in in a lab, and then you then you put them back in, and then it works great for like sickle cell anemia for, for other applications. But it, but for the for the majority of applications where you want to do in vivo, this is a big problem. So um, we the 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 path we went is we went with ring fingers. And these have the big problem: a, they're smaller, so 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 they're easy to fit to fit and deliver, and b, they're fully human, so so they're so they're, they're much less likely to be to be to be immunogenic. Um, so the the main the main problem has been is that zinc finger, the zinc finger problem has never been solved. So zinc fingers are, are have been fiendishly complicated. So they they bind DNA sort of like this. So this, this is the representation of DNA, and they bind like this. But um, but it has been very difficult because they bind in these long arrays. And and these arrays, all these neighbors, all influence each other. And and uh, and depending on how this one looks like, this one will have to differ. And depending on this one looks, this one has to differ. So, so you have sort of an, an a combinatorial explosion of problems of um, of solutions. And uh, so a this this code of how to how to make a how to make a zinc finger that'll bind a given a given piece of DNA has never been solved. Despite and it's it's not for like a crime. So so there have been three decades of work going into this. And uh, and as I said, there's this there's this Adjacency problem here, and so just to so my my, my collaborator had a had a had a uh, had a um, an animation um, um, made. So basically, these these adjacent fingers have to be have to be compatible, right? So you can can you can have these these fingers, and and so this this one doesn't fit. This one doesn't fit, and but it once once you and you have to you have to find a comp compatible pair, and once once the, once you have the pair that fits. Then everything is good, but you have to make this. You have to make these. You have to make many, many of these pairs. So at least, at least, at least six fingers consisting of, of five of five adjacent pairs. You to to get them to fit. So that that has been has been a large problem. So um, so what we did is we we took an approach of doing a fair amount of 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 of, of experiments to get which helices are compatible. So we so we saw for the single helices and then we thought for the for the two helices which are compatible, and then we built a, a language model. And this language model is a is a so-called hierarchical language model. So um so we we have here these classical transform architectures, right? And and uh, this this DNA binding problem is a classical transform problem in the sense that that we're 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 we're, we're putting in we're putting in I mean um, DNA sequence so so with four bases and we and we want we want to get out. Um, we want to get out um, 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 amino acid sequences, so 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 so, so twenty residues, and so so it, it's, it's effectively a translation problem, and um, so you can can build a transformer each to solve the single the single helix problem, and then on top of that, as as, as the hierarchical model, we're putting in we're putting in another module that solves the solves the compatibility problem. And we can we we have enough training data on on to to train both to train both the to train both the um, the lower level modules and the upper level module, and and lo and behold this model this model works works very well and works by far way better as you can see in these in comparison plots than than any model that that, that existed before, and um and when we when we test when we test this model um to to design new zinc fingers we get we get that almost all of them work. And a quarter of them works works really really well, which brings us about level with with, with how well CRISPR works, right? So, so in terms of accurate, in terms of accuracy, so we're so we're we're about as good in making new zinc fingers to target a certain piece of DNA as you would when when, when you get when you get to what CRISPR guide RNAs, and then we can use that to um, to reprogram trans transcription factors, so we can we can effectively take a natural zinc finger transcription factor, so we can we can cut out the zinc fingers and we leave its its it's 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 affected domain. So the what what actually what actually will 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 influence the DNA to to regulate up or down. We can we can put in a new zinc finger set of zinc fingers, and then and then now we can regulate the the expression of any gene in the genome at will. And um and so we can we can uh, actually let me, let me skip that. So what what we, what we can easily do right is we can we we can we can we can take an activator. We can test it here. On, on a, in, the, in this test reporter system, and, and we can see here we we get a very nice activation. We can, we can also we can also use use the repressor system, and we we get we get very nice re repression of this of of this um of this um um, um of this of this gene here and and in, in the reporter system. Um, what we what we've already done is we have uh, 
we've used this to um, to to activate or repress certain uh, disease genes. And in, in this in this case here, we can we can repress alpha synuclein, and that's that's a, that's a gene that's been uh, that's been associated with Parkinson's disease. And we can we can we can find a number of things that that are that are very efficient in repressing Parkinson's alpha synuclein, I mean, making them potentially valuable for 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 treating Parkinson's disease. Or we or we can make uh, zinc fingers uh, this is activated protein C CDKN1, um, which which is also which would also be therapeutically relevant. Um, finally, you know our initial designs have have many off targets and the volcano plots here you can see here, these are the intended targets. You can see here this this is this is how this, this is how much they were activated and this is how significant it is. So you can see here we be. We do repress the target and we do activate the target quite well, but uh, we can see here there's there's a there's a spread of other stuff that happens and we and we don't really want that. Right? We 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 only want our target to be activated in this case. So uh, we can we can do some engineering and from with, with some engineering we 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 get we get better zinc fingers that that in this case sort of you know a pris, you know, it's almost at almost a pristine specificity where we only upregulate upregulate our our own target but but nothing else. Um, okay, so I think that that's it. This is my lab. This is my funding, and then I also want to, want to acknowledge the, the folks at Fable Therapeutics, and I'll thank you for your attention. Well, great. Thank you very much. Um, Ashia, are there any uh, questions on the call? Well, then I guess one maybe a, a big picture question is: uh, to what extent is Experimental data a limited bottleneck because that seems to be the most expensive bit of this the entire flow you've been describing so far. Well, I mean, so so in the so especially in the structural world, right? So 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 getting 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 new protein structures, especially protein complex structures, is still quite an undertaking, right? So so it's still it's still pretty it's still pretty expensive to get that. And when you talk about um, when we talk about the antibody antigen problem, right? That's that um, um, you know we, we, would, we would certainly be doing much better as if you had ten times the data or hundred times the data, right? We um, we won't be we probably won't be getting ten times the data anytime soon, right? So um, so so I, I my my I pers I, my personal belief is is that with and and I, and I put my money by my Moses, right? So we're so we 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 we're, we're doing that uh, we're doing that at Fable is um, is that with 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 uh, with sort of smarter use of the existing data, we're we're doing we're going to be doing much better, right? And and so and so 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 I think the I think the more modern models do 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 get you stuff in in, the, in, the, in this field, and so and so so just the adoption of of um, so we're 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 in a situation where we where we can where we where we can simply ad, uh, adapt the the the. The, the sensible events that, 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 that come to us are uh, given to us from sort of the the broader machine learning field, and uh, and the ones the ones that, that really pay dividends do do pay dividends massively. And that's, that's a good a good example was with diffusion, right? I mean, diffusion, you know, just a few years ago was was sort of a kind of an, ex, an obscure machine learning concept, and now it's it's been transforming, you know, certainly the protein world, but 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 but, but all, all the many other applications, right? That makes sense. Um... And okay, so another some of the things you were doing, like uh, leverage physical models, where you just uh, had some foundational data sets that the protein folding is maybe alpha fold was based on, on those. Uh, but I didn't hear much about like a hybrid, any hybrid methods that said here are physical constraints like conservation of uh, momentum or whatnot that guided your ML approach. Like, would those constraints be useful, or would partial physical models be you know? Yeah, so, so so I'm I'm still. Um... I'm still um, um, of the opinion that that sort of this this this, this physics-based stuff is still useful. Uh, I, I should I should probably concede that um, that their usefulness, both perceived and real, has certainly gone down in the last um, in the last couple of years, right? So it's been it's been increasingly recognized and it's been increasingly proven that um, that these you know fully data-driven methods have Outperform physics-based methods, you know, at and at, at many more things than 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 we, than we than we than we would have thought. I still think that I still think that, that there's still something there for physics-based methods, but uh, but but uh, but I think the the, the, the jury the, the jury is to, to a certain extent out. To to what, to what extent we will be we will be we will be we will still be using physics-based method in let's say five years from now. I mean, so I would have 
uh, five years ago, I would have thought that um, that so many most things around at least at least protein protein design or sort of you know protein binding design, we would still be doing you know like 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 force fields and these sort of things, right? And it turns out we're, we're, we're at this point we're, we're using very little of that at, at, at this point. I mean, there's, there's still a, there's still a tiny bit of it in there, but 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 it's but it's uh, it's it's not not much not much anymore. I would I would say that um, that for um, that the, that where where where, where there does seem to be still a still a sense for at least physical inspiration, all these all these you know these, these new generative models, right? These, these new generation generative models, like. Uh, like PFGMs have a physical inspiration, inspiration, right? Flow, flow matching has a physical inspiration, right? So there, so there, so there is still physics has still some some stuff to teach us, I think. I think in, in, in that sense. Right. So because yeah, you're pushing it in that, because there's a bunch of, I mean, there's a whole literature at this point on having, I guess, physics models with a bunch of bits missing and learned by ML to make the whole thing faster. I mean, from just making a neural surrogate, and I mean, there's many ways. So I guess the real question here is. If, let's see if my interpretation is, is reasonable. Uh, ML-based models say, well, the space of possible behaviors is not so big. Here it is, approximately. Physics-based models say the space of possibilities is enormous. And I mean, with a lot of work, figure out which subspace is this particular thing. Uh, and to what extent can we get physics models to just focus on the tiny space that is actually feasible and be you know, a million times faster? Yeah, okay, so so so, so that, that that's of course so there so there's I think there are several ways this this uh, this union this union can can help and that's that's certainly one way, right? I think the the, the other way the other way is and, and there's and there's there's sort of a whole literature on that is um is to is to effectively still make a physics based processes, right? So for instance you, you can do you can do this whole field of doing of generating you know learned force fields. And do MD molecular dynamics with learned force fields, right? Because you know, the, and the the rationale for that is right is that the um, and that that's something I've I've I've, I've uh, you know that that really made sense to me that sort of a a an amber force field or a charm force field, right? It was it it was always you know data based in the sense it, it it was always it was it was it was never it was never real physics, right? Because real, real physics is quantum mechanics, right? And then and, and you can't and, and then you have to do DFT or you have to do you have to do something to to, to get quantum mechanics, right? So you so you always have some sort of data driven thing. And why not make it more data driven, right? Why not why not why not replace your 10 parameters with you know a million parameters and learn them some something. Right. And and so and so I think that this that, that's now that's now a growing field and and, and I, I I don't I only follow it like 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 a bit in like on in my peripheral vision, but but there seems to be some some quite promising work in in, 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 the, in that realm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean multi-scale physics is exactly this. You ignore the lower low substructure, but nobody uses well it's still emerging how to use ML as some of these lower level, more detailed physics, you know, with a high level models. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, but 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 I think that that's that's an exciting field. Uh, the the there, but I think there's a lot of work ongoing going right now. Okay. Well, it sounds good. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. It was fascinating. Oh no, no worries, no worries. Thank you, thank you guys for listening.